found out that I could play the game on August 12, 2009 against the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, that particular game, I, I, I returned a punt and I, I wasn't getting as many reps in practice, but every rep I did get in practice, I, I tried to make the least amount of mistakes as I could possibly. And, you know, a lot of people, you go through a time of when you're in a, in a grind of life, you're, you're going through, you know, uh, a process to get to where you're trying to go. There's like these times where you go to practice and I felt like I was going to get cut the next day because I had a mental error on this or I did this. And, and, but I just kept out it with my effort and knowing what I had to do to, to improve and continually just tried that. And then, you know, our first preseason game, my first time ever returning a punt, I took it to the, you know, I took it down for a 75 yard touchdown. I opened the game with the tackle. And once I started seeing that I could play against these guys, you know, I, I kept on feeling my confidence wasn't always there because I was, you know, the coaches, they do everything to kind of get you ready and they got to kind of beat you down to see if you're accountable to go into a battle. You know, can he mentally stay afloat when things are in an adverse situation of some sort? So they beat you down, beat you down, beat you down. Then, you know, I had that satisfaction of making plays through all that hard work. That's when I felt, you know, maybe I am called to play football at this level. Hey, everybody, Rabbi Bill Hamilton here, excited to announce a new season of Amenable Ideas. That is ideas that are agreeable, good for you and good for others. Lots more to come this season, many episodes in the coming months. For now, I hope you enjoy this special conversation with Julian Edelman and his father, Frank, on high holiday takeaways. Among the subjects we'll cover will include how we get a lot of negative energy out of our headspace how we answer our calling, how we crowd out the bad by doing the good, and how we find ourselves an opportunity to keep learning and growing. Enjoy. All right, guys. So let's start, as we do every week, by talking about different subjects. This high holiday takeaway special edition is going to focus on some subjects that come up on the high holidays. That is the Jewish New Year on Rosh Hashanah. And on Yom Kippur, the first thing I want to talk about is effort, effort, elbow grease. We know what it means in terms of how we actually put effort into our performance and trying to achieve stuff. Why, when it comes to relationships and life and working through testy relationships with other people, trying times with friends, why does it count? Why do you get an A for effort when it comes to working hard, breaking a sweat in those kinds of things? Why does that sometimes matter as much as whether or not somebody comes to the right place in their thinking when you're working through something hard? What do you think? I think because effort can't be taught. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's something that you can always give. And I'll bring it back to football. One of the things you always had to have was high effort to make any kind of improvement in anything. So the fact that you can go out and God has blessed you with the mindset to be able to do something for the betterment of you or your relationship, effort should always be there. And, it, and it's hard. It, it, it's hard because people, you know, nat it's natural human nature to have the case of the lazies every once in a while, like where you don't want to because it's hard. Nice, Julian. Nice, Julian. Frank, anything to add? Myself and my son, Julian, and my family members, we are high effort people. I mean, we could talk about athletes, we could talk about our job, but we could talk about our family. Mm -hmm. um, but some people are born with size, speed, strength, but they lack effort. Mm -hmm. And I think effort can go a long way if maybe you don't have some of those intangibles that God has given us. Effort putting towards your family, your wife, your children. I think, you know, it's funny how we don't put the effort towards those things as we do our individual goals. And yeah. I think it's real important. And I think a lot of that is learning. You know, you learn, the more we learn, the green we grow, the ripe we rot, you know, that's kind of our philosophy. So I think, Learning and continuing effort on relationships and family are uh, 
are something that we all need to strive for greater heights. Beautiful, beautiful points from both of you guys. I, I have to say that, you know, when somebody is trying, when I'm in a disagreement with somebody and I can tell they're breaking a sweat, they actually care. I sense that it actually matters. I sense that they're not being cavalier. They're not being casual about the whole thing. But one of the fundamental ideas on the high holidays is not only do we have to make things right between us and God, but we have to put some elbow grease and break a sweat trying to make things right between us and our fellow human beings. And again, it's not something you can teach or necessarily, it's something you got to sort of learn through experience and apply what you do in your own life for your own achievements to things that matter in your relationships and your family and your friends. That's powerful. It's, it's, it's attractive too. Like, you know, if, if you, if you're in a relationship and you see the other person's giving high effort, then there, you know, there's a standard you have to bring up your, your, your end because you want to be accountable or if you're on a team and you, you know, you're an older player and you see a young guy who's given high effort doing anything he can to make the team or do something like you sit there and you respect that. And, and it's just something that's attractive to human being. I think if, you know, and not everyone can do it. Not everyone's motivated to do it. It's hard. Yeah. But you know, if you strive for it, you know, it, it can, it can improve you. Yeah, nice, nice. There's a there's a teaching in Pirkei Avot. The, that's the 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 lessons, the wisdom of the sages from the Talmud. That it's it's actually Aramaic. It says Lefum Sara Agra. According to the effort is the reward. The effort determines the reward. You know what you put in is what you get out. Especially in this season of the high holidays of trying to do self-improvement of trying to choose better of trying to become better versions of ourselves to some extent going back to what we do for ourselves for the sake of others and for the sake of our relationships there's a direct relationship between how hard we work at it and what we get out of it the effort still has to continue and you have to be satisfied with the effort at least you're happy with yourself that you applied that effort and i i think that goes a long way for um human beings you know people self-confidence nice. self-confidence nice. well said son nice nice so now i want to talk about another subject which is the relationship judaism has with forgiveness and we've learned together as you we've been learning together uh, for we're now into our second year i love it every single week without fail it's very very special to share the time with you guys and to learn the weekly torah portion to do everything we do uh, to continue to deepen our appreciation for what the tradition can bring to our lives I want to talk about letting go. Letting go is different than forgiving. Letting go is something we do for ourselves, not for somebody else. Um, in fact, sometimes the, the person that we're asked to sort of have to do something about, something they did terribly wrong, immoral, criminal, whatever it may be, uh, we're in no position to even want to let go, uh, forgive them. They don't deserve to be forgiven. But as a favor we do to ourselves, we basically sort of put down what it is that we've been carrying around because it's just serving no purpose other than to weigh us down and occupy too much space in our heads. Uh, specifically because what they did was so wrong, they don't deserve to loom large in our minds. We talked about that. I want to talk about a slightly different idea, which is trying to demonstrate good taste in duos we have when we go toe to toe with somebody with whom we disagree somebody who's an opponent somebody who's an adversary uh i worry that sometimes if we're not careful when you go toe to toe with somebody who's really not a good not not doesn't have your best interest at heart they can end up dragging it down um uh, there was somebody who who said that i think from bosnia years ago you know your enemy is winning when they are making you into uh, as bad as they are or worse than they are, <laughs> right? And, and, and so I'm wondering, again, as a kind of self-care, I'm curious how you guys look at this whole idea of letting go when it comes to uh, our own interest. Yeah, it comes back to being disciplined and, and just trying to evolve yourself and better yourself. Uh, you know, if you're going to let someone live, as, as the young people say, rent free in your head, 
which is someone that is, you know, basically inside your head and making you, making you go crazy over certain energies and things that you shouldn't even be worrying about that that's, that's not how, that's not really going to affect anything, but make you worse. Like we were talking about let go because it's not doing you any good. It's not doing them any good. And ultimately, you know, if you're really trying to improve yourself, let's just do things and worry about things we can control that help improve ourselves. I've always preached to my children and, and my employees that we really don't have time to waste on negative energy. Mm. Yeah, you know, we try, our, you know, if there's nothing, you can't worry about things you can't control, as Julian said. Negative energy just takes space in your brain. Frank, I remember, or my pops, he used to say, I remember he said something to me like, hate is just a real energy burner. Mm. You know, it, it, it just, it burns too much energy. I don't, I, you know, and, and that's sunk with me and a, and a friend of mine who, he's a musician. He heard that. And, you know, I remember him texting me right away because it was on some publication that we did or something. And, you know, it was, uh, it, it really, it's true. You know, you sit there and you, and you think about bad things, negative things, you know, it, it's kind of like a poison in your mind and mm. it can lead you down different roads that you like, do we really want to go down these roads? Yeah. So powerful, powerful. Yeah. Beautiful point. Beautiful point. I told you the story last week of the, the 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 two Buddhist monks that are walking along the countryside and they 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 come across up to a river and there's a, a a very, very pretty woman on one side of the river in a in a nice dress and she can't cross the river because it's a little choppy. The waters are, are are pretty high. So one of the Buddhist monks just spontaneously picks her up and carries her across. And places are down on the other side and they go on their way. And being Buddhist monks, they don't have a lot to say to each other. So about two and a half hours later, one of them says, you know, I don't think it's right for, for people in our, our, our calling, our walk of life to be coming in close contact with women uh, that are attractive and dressed that way. And the other monk looks at him and he says, are you still talking about that woman? I put her down two and a half hours ago right Perfect. this idea that yes. you know there's a there's a point at which we just deposit and move on and uh, and 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 it's much easier to say than do let's be fair we know that this stuff really can eat away at us but all these points about the poison in, in your mind and the, the and that also goes to that also goes to like almost to like manipulating your mind with great things in your life so if you keep your mind busy at task on certain things to improve yourself, you don't have time to even think about negative energy or negative things or the hot girl across the thing because you have so many things you're focused on trying to get yourself better. That is so wise. That is so wise, Julian, because there's a verse. I wasn't going to talk about this, but you just taught a really powerful lesson in the Psalms. There is a verse that says, Sur me ra ve tov. It's a Hebrew. It says, Distance yourself. Sur me ra. Sur me ra. Sur me ra. Ve ase tov. Ve ase tov. Distance yourself from bad and do good. And what the, the Hasidic masters, my teacher, Rabbi Heschel, once taught is that the way you actually crowd out the bad the way you actually eliminate the bad is by doing the good in other words you actually fill your life with positive things and that literally removes all the room right from uh the, the other things the negative things no longer have any space in your life because you're 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 crowding them out by doing good what can stop a bad habit is doing something else that generates the same release of dopamine, <laughs> right? That you know, it's because the reason it can't, the reason self control doesn't work, um, is because there's no reward for it in your brain. You don't, you don't get any dopamine release. You don't, in other words, you're you're expecting some kind of reward at when you do the the thing that gives you the that that kind of release. But then choosing not to do it, it's great and it'll last for a little while. But you know, you can't live that way without any reward coming into your brain so so instead fill your life with things that release dopamine that are actually positive and good and good for you and good for others 
and you'll get plenty of release of, of dopamine and plenty of positive reinforcement. And that that poison, that burning energy, the bad stuff, as you put Frank, that uh, that stuff just gets crowded out. I think it's like anything else. Like you, we practice, we lift weights to get stronger. We jog, we practice, we do things. If you you want to have something when you're done, like you don't need a payoff. You know, I mean, ultimately, like you're saying, you do. You want to fill things to take take that space away, but also you want to be disciplined enough to say. I don't need a reward. I'm just going to move on. So now I want to talk about a, a, a third subject. We're going to we, we're going to hit we're going to hit four subjects today. Um, a, a third subject is the notion of being called. That is feeling our that we are at a place in life where we're doing what we're meant to do, what we're called to do, our vocation, not just our job, but what we're our irreplaceable qualities and strengths that we bring into the radius of influence that we have in the world. And we are called to do that. Um, I, I, I think that in many ways, that's what happened with Abraham, the, the originator of, uh, of the covenant with God, God's covenant with him and the, the beginning of our people, the Jewish people. And the call continues to go forth. And on, on Rosh Hashanah, as we sounded the shofar, we did it a few weeks ago in our learning uh, the call, the shofar, the ram's horn is what we're meant to listen to and to respond to. The unique way in which Jews, uh, the Jewish people, receive that call has consistently prevented us from slipping into the trap of victimhood. We live in a world where people assume the posture of being victims all the time. And we, as a people, by answering our call, and finding a unique way to our responsibilities in life, never really run the risk of slipping into victimhood. And I want to tell you a quick story. The musical artist, uh, the late musical artist, Leonard Cohen, Madi Friedman has a wonderful book, Who By Fire, our dear friend Madi. And, uh, and he tells the story of how in 1973, Leonard Cohen, who was a very, very accomplished uh, a musical artist in his day, had given up. He was at a low point. He was 39 years old and he moved to a Greek island and he said he was done with his career. He was done with, uh, with, with, with contact with people. He was done with everything and he was living in seclusion. One day he reads in the newspaper in October of 1973 that Israel is at war. And it's the Yom Kippur War in 1973 when Israel is attacked from Egypt by Egypt in the south and by Syria in the north in the holiest day of the year, the day, of course, where uh, uh, we observe each fall, Yom Kippur. And, and he decides to amble down the side of the mountain from this little Greek island, get on a boat, take it to Athens, get on a plane, take it to Tel Aviv. And he plays concerts for the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces soldiers, throughout the Sinai Desert for the next few weeks. And it's a very low point in his life. It's a very low point in Israel's life because it's a very, very challenging time. The war, the, the future is in peril. Over 2,600 soldiers lose their lives in that war. A huge number for anybody, but certainly for a country the size of Israel. But at the end, he writes in his diary, I learned to sing again. I can sing again. And he goes back to his career, goes back to, to continue a life of another four decades, five decades of musical productivity, including the Hallelujah, Hallelujah song and many others. And so the, the interesting thing is, he's not clear why he did that. He doesn't really know. And Mahdi's book, which is a great book, all about the story, is very thorough, but it doesn't really come to a conclusion about why Leonard Cohen would do that. I believe. He was being called. I believe that he was. He felt that this was a moment that was waiting for him to enter this drama and play the role he would play. And this notion of being poised to hear it, being ready in your life to accept it, and the charges that go with taking that call, right? not the financial charges, but the, the sort of the larger sense of what the charge is for you is very, very powerful. And I'm curious, Julian, in your, in your remarkable career, um, did you ever have a sense 
when you were working your tail off, uh, thanks to your dad's incredible encouragement and everything else, um, that you were feeling called? Yeah, there was a time where I felt like I was called and, and, and being called for me at that time in my life was basically being able to be a professional football player and, and carry out with my dream and go inspiring other kids. And when I found out that I could play the game on August 12, 2009 against the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, that particular game, I, I, I returned a punt and I, I wasn't getting as many reps in practice, but every rep I did get in practice, I, I tried to make the least amount of mistakes as I could possibly and, you know, a lot of people, you go through a time of when you're in a, in a grind of life, you're, you're going through, you know, uh, a process to get to where you're trying to go. There's like these times where you go to practice and I felt like I was going to get cut the next day because I had a mental error on this or I did this. And, and but I just kept out it with my effort and knowing what I had to do to, to improve and continually just tried that. And then. You know, our first preseason game, my first time ever returning a punt, I took it to the, you know, I took it down for a 75-yard touchdown. I opened the game with the tackle. And once I started seeing that I could play against these guys, you know, I, I kept on feeling my confidence wasn't always there because I was, you know, the coaches, they do everything to kind of get you ready and they got to kind of beat you down to see if you're accountable to go into a battle. You know, can he mentally stay afloat when things are, in an adverse situation of some sort. So they beat you down, beat you down, beat you down. Then, you know, I had that satisfaction of making plays through all that hard work. That's when I felt, you know, maybe I am called to play football at this level, you know, and then after that going on and, and uh, you know, grinding my way to earning a role on the team and then becoming a, you know, a weapon on the team, you know, that, that I learned through social, now I have a calling to have a platform to, you know, promote uh, the things that I love. And, and, and hopefully those, those things, you know, have a good impact on a lot of people through my story and through the, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff, but there's also a lot of overcoming adverse situations, just like anyone else, you know, we're all human. And, you know, there's a lot of great things that, I, you know, some of the hardest years of my life, they came after accomplishing after that year. Like, it just made me more and more confident that, man, I was in that low of a spot. And the simple fact that I was able to stay mentally afloat and get myself out of it through the support that I had with my family, of course, and, and the, you know, the resources you have, but ultimately it comes down to you, you know that gave me a confidence booster and that gave me a calling as well. Like, all right, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Powerful. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Frank, anything to add? Well, the other day, a, a, a gentleman, a friend of mine, he goes, Frank, do you ever pinch yourself? And I said, no, not really. And he goes, do you realize your son is one of a million people who your son plays in the NFL and, your son is Julian Edelman. And basically when you have a son like Jules, that is who he is or an athlete or whomever, that is a star. Sometimes you have to be called to be the president of Pop Warner. Sometimes you have to be called to be the librarian. Sometimes you have to be called to be whatever it is. And that is an important calling. And that's where you have to go. But you can look at it also that your calling was to prepare me as a young man to a man physically, emotionally, and mentally to go on to what I've done. So that, that could be your calling. I don't know. Now, I think yeah. my calling would be, God said, abuse your son, make him strong. <laughs> <I'm teasing. laughs> so, but, right. but right. You know, you know that, that everybody matters, you know, and ev everybody has a calling. It may not be as great as how fortunate our calling was, but yeah. every calling is important and everybody needs to follow their calling. Yeah. And the beautiful thing, you know, as we've been learning and as you guys have embodied in the in the Jewish tradition and our Jewish tradition, when we feel called, our response is not only to elevate to that calling, but to, to also respond to the calls of others. And yes, it's about 
what you do, but it's also about how you can use the platform to uh, in, in service of others and encourage their calls, Frank, as you're doing now, to responding to their calls. I, I, I just don't want to lift up one thing with the PBS ran a series of the last last week on the history of the, the US and the Holocaust. And it was a very, very difficult series to watch, but the world didn't allow Jews to go, right? So basically Hitler at the time was like, anybody can have the Jews, but nobody would accept the Jews. And then of course, he proceeded to murder um, uh, 6 million Jews in the Holocaust. And what's remarkable is that our people would have had every right to collapse into victimhood. We didn't assume that posture, not for a moment. Instead, we grieved and we continue to grieve over the victims of the Holocaust, but we rose, we restored our ancestral homeland with the state of Israel, and we built a bright future. Let's be clear. There are people vic who victimize other people, and that is a real reality when somebody attacks somebody else, for instance. But to decide to become, to be defined as a victim, that's your decision, right? You, you don't decide whether you are victimized, but you decide if you're going to assume the posture of victimhood. And that posture is very rights focused and rights matter, of course, Every, rights matter mightily. But at the end of the day, if you are a, totally immersed in your responsibilities to answer your calling and to answer the calls of others and to use your platform responsibly, you're not likely to slip into the trap of victimhood. And, and that is one of the reasons why the state of Israel, Zionism, all of that is just a continuation of the call to Abraham once upon a time, 4,000 years ago. Julian, I've heard you say before that you feel identification with Israel because of this underdog thing, and that's absolutely right. But it's also right, I think, that you're know, working your tail off and accepting your calling and then taking it forward to add responsibility for what you represent and, and, and what you can inspire in others. That too is, a, is, is at the core of the Zionist story. And that is the core of, uh, of what has made uh, the state of Israel such an important contributor in the family in the form of nations as it turns 75 this coming spring. Now let's get to one last subject, which is the importance of a steady diet of uh, learning. There's another teaching in Pirkei Avot, in the ethics of the fathers, and that says, Aser lecha rav. Aser, Aser. lecha, lecha. <laughs> rav. You rav. got it. Rav. And that means uh, make, find yourself a teacher. And, and what's, uh, what's powerful is the idea that we've been doing this for now into our second year of learning together, I wonder if you'd each reflect on it as you did back at Hanukkah time when we first did one of these sessions and just reflect on just what it means to have something consistent, have something uh, present uh, in your life on a weekly basis that helps you keep this steadiness and this and your bearings as you make your way through uh, what we all struggle with, which is the ups and downs of any week. You know, this meant a lot. You know, it's, it's great to... Uh to take time we you know time is is something that when when you look at it is probably the most valuable thing you know we can all talk about extrinsic rewards of money car this or you know accomplishing your goal but like having time time is the most valuable thing and to take time out of your day uh you know to to sit and learn with uh with you rabbi hamilton and with my father about our heritage about our people you know, it's, it's, it's meant a lot to us and it's, it's been great for my you know relationship with me and my father. And it's kind of, you know, we, we've spent so much time together in our life through, you know, sport and, and, uh, through just life, uh, him at home. And we were just a very close group. You know, there's been, a, there's been a, you know, as you grow up and you leave the house, you know, you get less time together and, you know, this kind of brings us back to when we used to get the bat and balls and he would just sit and throw me 
you know, uh, baseballs or if it was footballs or if it was basketball, you know, that, that was valuable time and to have this time to learn. Cause that's what we were doing. We were learning. He was teaching me and I was learning. And, you know, anytime you want to improve, you got to work smart. You can't just work hard, you know, uh, and that's what Bill Belichick would always say for improvement to happen. You have to, you have to work smart. You have to find someone who knows what you have to do to put you on the wavelength that you were trying to accomplish and, and work hard at those things. Cause you can't just work hard on your own. Cause if you don't know what to work hard on. So it's always great to have a teacher. And I've always been huge with having mentors like my father. And then, you know, the, the pivotal people that helped me get to where I'm at through coaches and mentors, you know, so it, it, it's, this has been a very valuable time for, for me. And, and I, I can't speak for my dad, but probably him too. For me, not being educated as I grew up, I, uh, I didn't know things. And so what we did is we would hire tutors and teachers and coaches for our children because I didn't want them to be left behind. And I wasn't going to make an excuse saying, well, I don't know it, so we're going to move on. That's not how it works. There are resources out there and you have to find those resources to improve yourself. And Rabbi Hamilton, I appreciate you so much because you give, you, you give us wisdom. You teach us about Judaism. You, give, you share valuable time with me and my son. And while we're discussing and we're learning, I always have something to say to my son. And it is, you see, Jules? See what Rabbi said? <laughs> you see, Jules? <laughs> but teasingly, but seriously, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. And I look forward to it every single week. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, it means so much to me, too. I learn a lot from you guys. Some really important takeaways from these high holy days about the importance of effort, about the need to let go from time to time, about what it is to be called, what it is to add responsibility. Jules, you added the piece in there about the importance of, of crowding out the bad by doing the good. And, and these are all lessons that we're going to take into the year, in addition to the idea of having a steady diet of learning um, so, uh, so even though I'm the one who's representing the Torah and the tradition, I, I, I feel like I'm always on the receiving end of, of deep insights from the two of you. So uh, I want to take close by inviting you to, to wish everybody a Shana Tova and a sweet, healthy new year. Shana Tova, and I hope everyone has a sweet, healthy, happy new year. Shana Tova. We thank you all, and we hope you all health, love, and happiness. And sweet for the honey. Honey and apple, pop. Oh, sweet. <laughs>